So Maria Reza has been accused of fraud, of tax evasion and even of receiving money from the CIA. She's been convicted of libel and she could spend years in jail. But she's also this year's joint winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace for what the Nobel Committee called her courageous fight for freedom of expression in the Philippines. There, she's been a thorn in the side of the president, Rodrigo Duterte, and through her website, Rappler, she's uncovered government corruption and shone a light on the country's brutal war on drugs, all while facing a campaign to silence her and to silence Rappler. And I'm delighted to say she joins us now live from Manila. Uh, Maria Ressa, it's a real pleasure to have you on France 24. Thank you for your time and congratulations. Thank you and thanks for having me. Um, it's been nearly a week since you got that call to hear that you are this year's joint recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace. Give us a sense of what the last week has been like. Is it all now sinking in for you? Not yet. I'm still stunned. Um, but, you know, it, talking to journalists all around the world has been an amazing experience. Uh, we've had gone through a really difficult five years since 2016. But at the same time, this morning, I was talking to editors from Venezuela, which ranks even lower than the Philippines in terms of the World Press Freedom Index. And I spoke to editors in Indonesia and India, right? And I guess part of what what is dawning on me is that this, when the Nobel Committee chose journalists for this year's awards, it is, it were placeholders for everyone else. Every journalist around the world is, you know, one of the questions you asked in the teaser is, is it more dangerous? Is it more difficult? It is all of that. It is more dangerous. It requires more sacrifices just to do what journalists have always done. You've had congratulations flooding in, I'm sure, from all over the world in the last six days. But perhaps you weren't expecting to hear it from the president of your own country, Rodrigo Duterte. He's pursued something of a vendetta against you, hasn't he, and against your organisation, Rappler. But via his spokesperson, he said um, it was a victory um, for the Philippines that you won. How did you feel when you heard him say that? Um you know, that morning, uh, one of our local anchors asked me whether I was expecting it. And I said, well, it would be professional, especially since President Putin and the Kremlin had already congratulated Dmitry. Uh, I think it was double edged because, you know, the first sentence is that. And then the next one was to talk about the legal cases. And I still maintain as that, as do my lawyers, that these are, you know, lots of legal acrobatics uh, for cyber libel, for example. I was convicted along with a former colleague uh, for of, of this crime that didn't exist when we published a story I didn't write, edit, or supervise in 2012, when the period of prescription of libel had had already it was one year, right? So I feel like um, we correct the misperceptions, but. Um, but I'm happy, I suppose. <laughs> well, we're very happy for you. Congratulations um, again. And I'm really interested to know um, what kind of impact you think that this win may have on your work in the Philippines. You've already touched on the enormous challenges that you face personally. Um, I wonder what impact you think this spotlight on you will currently have. Will it make it easier for your team perhaps to work? Or do you worry that actually this may intensify the online campaign that is already very clearly directed against you? It's not just online. I mean, this is my 35th year as a journalist, and in less than two years, the Philippine government filed 10 arrest warrants against me. I've never lived through anything like that. Look, in, in 2018, when, when Time magazine named me as one, gave one of the covers for the person of the year, I it hit me in the gut because like the Nobel, I didn't know it was going to happen. And when it happened, I thought this is going to get worse. And in the end, it wound up putting a shield around me and around Rappler. This spotlight that the Nobel Committee gave to us in the Philippines is gave a boost of adrenaline, not just to me, to Rappler, but to all journalists here, especially as we prepare for crucial presidential elections that are going to be happening in May. But here's here's the rub. The last time a journalist received this prestigious award was in the 1930s, and that journalist languished in a Nazi concentration camp and died of complications from torture in that, right? So this is what I was telling our team uh, during our meeting afterwards. It's, you know, that, yes, this is a time of celebration in the sense that things could get better, 
but we always, as we have been for the last five years, must be prepared that things could get worse and we must keep doing our jobs. So are you at all optimistic then that we may see a sea change uh, once Duterte leaves power? You mentioned the elections that are taking place next spring. He is constitutionally barred from running in those elections. So might this be actually the beginning of the end of an era of this sort of crackdown on media freedom that you've witnessed? You know, I think about it like termites eating wood. The wood looks really strong, but then when you step on it, it cracks and breaks and you can fall. Um, the Dutertes have maintained power in Davao City since 1988, and they've used a legal loophole to keep the Philippines guessing after filing certificates of candidacy. It, it ended last Friday, but now because of a legal loophole they've used in the past and he used in 2016, which is substitution, we're going to have to wait till November 15th to figure out who the final candidates are for president and vice president. I think the problem is um, this is going to be the battle for facts, our elections. And American social media platforms, these American companies, are going to play a crucial role if they don't put guardrails uh, on the algorithmic spread of the flies. That's first. And then the second thing is, will our institutions recover? Right. Within about six months of the first year, you could see them caving in from within. And these cases that I've faced and Miracle has faced, um, in a normal time, uh, five years ago, they wouldn't have flourished in court. So now we fight them in court. And I'd certainly hope that, uh, that there's a rejuvenation of the institutions. Well, you're alluding there to um, what's been happening at Facebook in the last few weeks, particularly in the United States. There, of course, we've had that whistleblower accusing the company of effectively um, putting profit over the need to curb misinformation. Is that what you see happening as well in the Philippines? It's what's happening everywhere around the world. Uh, look, we blew the whistle on this, not to use Francis Haugen's word, but we, we in 2016, we demanded an end to impunity of President Duterte and his brutal drug war and Mark Zuckerberg in Facebook. And we continue to demand that because there hasn't been effective change for the better in any of in both of these strong men and the and the and the and the organizations that they run. I think that the problem we have here is that social media, Facebook, which is the world's largest distributor of news, is governed by algorithms that actually, and this research has shown, that spreads lies laced with anger and hate faster and further than facts. So this is where the news are. So our news is being distributed on a platform that is biased against facts, and it is biased against journalists. If you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without trust in the room, nothing is possible. Okay. A shared reality. And that this leads to perhaps why a peace prize, right? Because any facts are the beginning of any kind of human endeavor. If we don't restore that, trying to deal with existential problems like the coronavirus or climate change or the battle for truth is going to be impossible to do. We need to put the guardrails around the technology. And a lot of this seemed to get worse during the Donald Trump era in the United States. But Donald Trump has obviously left office and he's also been barred from social media effectively now. His tongue has been cut off. So I wonder whether you think that this is the... whether that con will continue now that Donald Trump is no longer in office, perhaps whether Duterte is no longer in office as well, or whether you worry that actually the debate has been fundamentally changed, even if these rather demagogic leaders are no longer in power? The world has fundamentally changed. I mean, think about it in terms of this. While Donald Trump may be temporarily out of Facebook, right, he has changed the tenor of public discourse in the United States. President Duterte has changed the tenor of discourse. Uh, the us against them type of divisive leadership, which plays so well on social media, uh, which outscreams others and manipulates other opinions out as, as, I guess, I don't think this problem is over. And this is what, what we're I'm most afraid of. Um, an American biologist, E.O. Wilson, said that the greatest crisis we're facing now is um, our paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. 
the godlike technology, and and uh, this is the last part I'll say, which is, you know, it's almost like you you've released this virus of lies in our information ecosystem. Everyone gets infected by this virus of lies, and people change their worldviews and then change the way they act. And a perfect example of this is January 6th. The people who, that violence on Capitol Hill, that meta narrative of stop the steal was seeded a year earlier on RT and then picked up by Steve Bannon on YouTube, distributed on closed pages, and then picked up by Tucker Carlson on Fox before being picked up by QAnon, and then finally coming top down from President Trump. Stop the steal. That's a meta narrative. The meta narrative of used against me. Journalist equals criminal. This was used in the Philippines against journalists. And that was seated in 2016, and I was convicted. Uh, uh, which I'm still appealing in 2020. This hasn't ended. And the people whose minds have been shifted will take a long time, right? This plays to your cognitive bias. Social media has become a behavior modification system. And we've become Pavlov's dogs. And that must stop. And as you've said, you know, you are somebody who's really felt the brunt of that. You even face possible uh, jail time yourself. I'm really interested if, if you're able to talk to us a bit about it. You know, you've been a journalist yourself for the past 35 years. What was it that got you so motivated to do this extremely challenging job in the first place? And was there ever a time where you thought, look, the pressures on me, the pressures on my family are just too intense. Maybe I need to quit, do something else. I, I love journalism. You know, I fell into journalism and I came into the, I, I think I grew up in the golden age of journalism. I was a for, I was um, the last group of foreign correspondents where it was just an in, incredible time of learning and it tested you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually on every front, right? Um, by the time the Duterte administration attacked me and Rappler, you can see we created Rappler in 2012 because we wanted, we knew that the future of journalism is entwined with technology. And it was very difficult. I was managing the largest news group in the Philippines. It's very hard to turn a legacy news group around because the processes and the culture will get in the way. So starting Rappler was actually better. By the time we were attacked in 2016 by the government, I, I already knew why I was doing what I was doing. I was, you know, I, I, I was in the tail end of my career. And when you're tested like that, you either are the values you say you are or you're not. And so I didn't even really think about it at the beginning. It was very clear the steps I needed to take, which is to call it out, to stand up to power. And then when I was arrested and detained overnight because they wanted me to feel their power, then I had firsthand experience of how power is abused. And over time, I gathered more first-person evidence. When you're afraid... And you always are afraid, fearless. You know, people ask me, well, you're so fearless. It's not about being fearless. It's just about managing your fear and then realizing why we do what we do. And always right now for journalists everywhere around the world, and I think this is what the Nobel Committee also had spotlighted, the mission of journalism, holding power to account, bringing the truth to the public. We are proxies of the public we serve. That mission has never been as important as it is today. Maria Reza, just before um, we let you go, I want to ask you one final question, if I may. Um, this is about some criticism that the Nobel Committee received um, this year, because you are the only woman this year to be nominated for a Nobel Prize. Um, in the past, I believe only 18 women have ever received um, Nobel Prizes at all. Um, you've spoken about how at Rappler you have made an effort to hire women. Is that a particular priority for you now? And do you think um, it's a failing of the journalism industry that we don't have more women in senior positions? I think it's culture. And I think you go across different nations. It's slightly different in each one. In the Philippines, um, we've had news heads who are women for a while. And in Rappler, we're 63% female and not by design. We're also, our median age is 23 years old. So we're actually young. It's the median age of the Philippines. Um, I think it's you, you know, the, the feminist movement has taken many steps forward, but again, technology has pushed it further back again. You know, it's almost like 
by empowering the rise of these types of leaders like Duterte, like Trump, like Bolsonaro. You have, um, you have this sexist, macho, and misogynist types that, that force us, that give permission to others in society to behave, to become their worst selves. And inevitably, when we look at the data that we have in the Philippines, women journalists are attacked at least 10 times more than men. So you absorb that, right? Um, in terms of the Nobel, I think it's hard. You can't put you can't put a quota. I mean, it's almost like I'm a minority in the United States when I was in school. You know, if you come in under a minority program, do I really deserve it? Or, or did I get it because I was a minority? And it's a question you would ask, right? So it's, I think, I think we need to move collectively. And in 1995 at the Beijing Women's Conference, there were a set of principles that were laid out that we were, the world was going to try to work towards. It was a time of great optimism. We've moved some, but there's so much still left to do. And I think that first, let's put the guardrails on tech so that women can reclaim the space. So many women journalists have opted out. Other women politicians have opted out. Let's bring them back. And then we move the cultures forward. Maria Reza, it's been a real pleasure to have you on France 24 today. We are out of time, but thank you very much indeed for your time today on France 24. Maria Reza there, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, talking to us on the programme.